Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ways to Change Your Workplace podcast with myself, your host, Prina Shah. And I'm very excited to bring to you today my friend, Karen Thomas Bland, all the way from Marleybone in London. Um, Karen, welcome. How are you? Oh, thank you, Prina. I am really well for 7 15 on a <laughs> Wednesday morning in the UK. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Karen, allow me to introduce you. Karen Thomas Bland is a global board level advisor, partner level management consultant, and a non executive chairwoman with over 27 years of experience in creating breakthrough strategies, transforming and integrating organizations. Karen has an excellent track record in creating sustainable, long-term value creation for FTSE and Fortune businesses and private equity funds. Karen is a trusted advisor to boards, executive teams, and investors. And Karen is the founder of Seven Transformation. Karen's clients are huge and varied, and they include IBM, Accenture, EY, KPMG, WPP, RELX Group, and many private equity funds. Karen lives in London, as I've already said, and operates globally. Karen has worked across five continents. Karen has featured in many publications, including the Financial Times, Association of MBAs, and Management Today. Karen is a chartered organizational psychologist and Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society and has a certificate in corporate govern governance from INSEAD Business School. Karen has been a non-executive chair and director for numerous private equity backed companies and has evaluated numerous boards. Now, Karen is very talented and I'm really happy to hear, have you here today. I've been following Karen's work for, gosh, since 2020, we were saying, so I've been semi-connected with Karen since around 2020 and Karen specializes in making uh, boards better uh, and this is something Karen or one of the things that you specialize in and this is what I really want to talk to you about today so in our conversation we're going to be talking about signs of a dysfunctional board and how we can find solutions to it but Karen I've spoken a lot I'm going to stop tell okay I've, I've done the official intro to you. Tell us why you do what you do and who are you, Karen? <laughs> Frida, thank you. Gosh, quite hard to follow. Thank you for introducing me better than I, I would have done myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you summarised it well. I have a bit of a portfolio career at the moment. So non-exec chair on private equity backed businesses. And I do transformation, M&A integration and strategy for the large kind of listed um, space. To answer the why I do what I do, I suppose what gets me out of bed in the morning is yeah. going and transforming businesses, whether that's at the board level, whether that's further down the organization. I like taking an organization from A to B. I enjoy working with them on that kind of journey and seeing the changes kind of come to fruition. Everything in my career has been about um, that. And the fact that I started life as an organizational psychologist means people is generally at the heart of everything that I'm trying to do. I'm super passionate about people, culture, and how we can make organizations and boards better. Brilliant. We have so many synergies, Karen. Now, we're talking about making boards better. But before we talk about that, what are the signs of a dysfunctional board? It happens so much. People so much talk about it. I've got many a client dealing with this. What are the signs of a dysfunctional board, in your opinion, Karen, and your special expertise, in fact? Yeah, Prina, it's a really great question. Look, and, you know, let me start by saying no board is perfect and we're all on a journey to try to, you know, improve and become more effective. If yeah. I think about the signs that are, you know, really kind of quite common, the first yeah. one I'd start with would be when you look at your board agenda and quite often you look at the list of topics, the amount of time you've got and you're like, wow, this is a lot to cover in quite a short space of time. So I think the first sign of a, an ineffective board for me is just an agenda that is bursting literally at the, the seams. 
So the second area is uh, about focus. So again, uh, boards have a tendency and can have a tendency to look backwards. And it, and it makes perfect sense. It's where you've got your performance metrics. So you look back and you look at how the business has performed perhaps over the last month or the last quarter. And quite a lot of the meeting is focused on that backward look. Uh -huh. Now, again, from a from an effectiveness point of view, whilst that is super important, there's a really important um, element to focus on the future, the future strategy, what's happening in the marketplace. Is our strategy still fit for purpose? Are we looking at how our customer base is changing? So there's that future element that needs to be brought in. My next area is about how in touch board members are with the core organization. And by that, I mean, do you really know what the customer base is thinking and feeling? Do you really know how the brand is showing up on you know, social media? Do you really have a sense of the employee base and what they're thinking and feeling beyond just the traditional staff attitude survey? Mm -hmm. So I call this around being a little bit out of touch with, with the business. If I come on to then some of the dynamics within a meeting, what can often happen, particularly as boards get refreshed, certainly in the UK in a listed sense, there's about a nine year term. And after nine years, you either have to move along or explain why, why you should stay. So there's this constant sort of rotational element. What can often happen as new members come in is you get these sidebar conversations. Maybe the old guard are, you know, clubbing together. Maybe the new people coming on a clubbing together and what you end up with is a bit of a fragmented board it could not always around newness it can be a be around other things maybe you've got digital natives versus none but you end up getting these splintering go going on the other one when you observe a board is a, and one that I you know would would have on my worry list or my red flag list is about boards that are in constant conflict so you want a healthy debate you want punchy conversations but if you're in constant conflict and firefighting the chances of being able to address the issues of the business I would say you know do do decline and link to that and I you know I uh, smile when I say this this veneer of collegiality there Ooh. is a sense and you know I, I I think to step back Board roles are very highly coveted everywhere. There, there are not many of them. Uh, they're highly competitive. And so when you finally secure that role, you want to make a good impression. You don't want to be kicked off. You don't want to have a controversial point of view. You, you want to secure your seat, basically. And so in that, you, want, you, know, you, you go along, you get along. And I've seen at times that can be a reluctance to actually say what you're really feeling and ask you know, those challenging uh, questions. And I see it with questions linked to that. You know, there can be a time where questions are asked simply just to make a point rather than to further the debate. You know, good questions bring a new angle on an issue or they further the conversation, but they're not there just for you to find your voice in, in the meeting. So it's about thinking about that contribution. The other one is, and you, we all hear this one, it's like, how often do I see my board members? I think if you're turning up on a monthly or quarterly basis, and that's probably the first time the organisation has seen you that month or that quarter, um, you're probably not that in touch with the organisation. You're a little bit more remote. And so, and again, there's good strides made here. More and more, there is that connectivity between meetings and getting involved in customer visits and, you know, meeting stakeholders and shareholders. But there is that connectivity point that really needs to um, sort of be addressed. And final one from me, uh, and this is a controversial one, I don't think it went in my last paper, is about when CEOs don't genuinely want a good board. So when they hire people for you know, cosmetic reasons. Yes, it looks good from a diversity point of view, but they don't really then take advantage of that and utilize their board in the right way. And so you'll hear the term, you know, a cosmetic board used, and you certainly don't want to find yourself on, on one of those. Can I add one more, Karen, if I may? I and this is something that's a repeat uh, occurring issue for a lot of the CEOs that I support. And that is that boards tend to get too involved in the operational and there's not that division that's supposed to be there. 
Um, would you say that that's a valid one to add to the list? Yeah, I think it really is true. And I think it links to that past and future as well. I think if all you've got is you're down in the weeds, in yeah. the data, in the performance, you're not really lifting your head up and looking at the macro perspective. You're not thinking about the organizational strategy. You're not thinking about those macro changes that are happening in the environment. How do you need to evolve the business? So I think that's completely true. And it's a common one I hear, you know, it's get straight into the weeds, straight into the detail, but it's actually the, the value of the board is being up above that and really thinking about it in the bigger context. Totally. And Karen, when you were talking, I was thinking about looking at the board as a team, which it effectively is, right? And um, effective team working, which we're talking to really here. So in a world of increasing complexity, uh, complexity, complexity, how can boards ensure that they create an environment of psychological safety for everybody involved, trust and cohesion in their meetings. And it's really good that you've got your psych background that you bring to all of your work as well, because it's so needed, especially with boards. Yeah, it's a really good one. And let's pick up on psychological safety first. Yeah. It, it comes back again. Do people feel comfortable to take an interpersonal risk? Ultimately, isn't it? That that is what this is about. Yeah. So to create an environment that people do feel one is is about the role of the chair here. So as a chair, to create that environment, it's often about being vulnerable yourself. So being very open and transparent with the board and saying, look. I maybe got that wrong. I, I didn't quite mean that. And, you know, so I think showing your own vulnerability can start to create that environment. The yeah. second one, is when people do take a risk and maybe, you know, raise the hand and say, I'm not sure about that and give an alternate perspective, even if you disagree, don't make them feel like they've done the wrong thing because then you role model to the rest of the board. Please don't take a personal risk because the consequences to you won't be favorable. So I think that's the other one. Third thing is, I, I think, and I do this on my boards as well, we have very open conversations about psychological safety where we talk about, do you feel open? Um, if not, am I, can I do something different? Is there something in my behavior that makes you feel like not being open and honest? And so, and often a good time to do this is around your board effectiveness review time. So every board tends to at least have an annual or biannual effectiveness review. A really good question to ask is, do you feel safe to take a personal risk on this on this board? Um, and the answer to that can often really spark that conversation about if not, why not? And what can we we do? But you're right. You want the board. It's a really interesting tension. You want the board to be as you say cohesive and a strong team but that they feel able to disagree and they feel really comfortable with tension and they can work through that and see it in a in a productive way absolutely so again i'm linking this to a team you know often when a brand new team is formed we'll have some kind of get to know you session and uh with boards often that's so effective as well isn't it in terms of not only getting to know the individual and all of the wonderful accolades that they come with but from a psychological perspective this is my working style this is how I communicate this is how I need to be communicated to this is how yeah. I listen this is the stuff that stresses me out this is how I am when I am stressed and for people to verbalize that themselves and for then others to listen and comprehend that and remember that, I think that completely changes the course of how any team, including a board team, operates. Would you agree with that, Karen? Yeah, I would completely. And one little tip I do have is yeah. I find it really helpful to have informal time with the board, not in a formal board meeting. So that could be, you know, a board lunch, a board dinner, a board right. breakfast where there isn't a structured agenda we're not trying to all you know overpower and show our you know great skills it's just about getting to know you what's going on in your life how are things for you it just builds that understanding of knowing each other and feeling more like a cohesive sort of group yeah it's that human to human connection the relationship is so important isn't it at that first level always with any job that we work in Wonderful. Now, you talked about jam-packed, boarded agendas being an issue. So 
Let's talk about that. How can boards strike a balance between the comprehensive discussions that they really do need to have and the time constraints? So it's quite the conflict, isn't it? Because there's a time limit yeah. and there's so much to discuss. How do we address this jam-packedness in that respect, Karen? Yeah, Prina, great, great question. Couple of things. So one is about the quality of the material that's sent in advance. So yes. back to the past and future, one thing that all CEOs can do is provide a board pack that gives yeah. all the board members the data points they need around performance and make it clear that the assumption is that you've come to the meeting having read that and therefore it will be a discussion. It won't be the CEO presenting all of that data, which takes an, a tremendous amount of time. So that, that's one way to manage it. Uh -huh. The second one you can do is flip the agenda. So classically board agendas are the first bit is all about the management team presenting operation of the business. And the second half tends to be the strategic topics, you know, should we expand to Australia? Should we buy this company? What you can flip it around. So if you do your strategic topics first, so they don't fly off the bottom of the agenda, and yeah. then your operational performance second, that can give kind of a little bit more time. The other one is there's a tendency on board agendas to have pretty much the same one each time and yes. my advice would be really vary it depending what's going on in the business one meeting you might deep dive around people and culture the next you might deep dive around sales and marketing so vary up your topics don't feel like each time you have to cover um ev everything and, and again I'd, I'd put this back on the chair roll you know to manage the agenda it's about making sure you make sure everyone has a voice but then you bring it to a conclusion you summarize that section and then you move it on as opposed to just letting a conversation you know roll roll on for too long oh gosh and that's quite the skill as well too it yeah. does feel like herding cats especially when you've got so many passionate people in the room you want to stop them and you want to get to that conclusion stage as well, don't you? So I understand the the pain point from the you know chairperson's perspective, absolutely so. But I love the fact that you talked about flipping the agenda as well. Genius. Uh, so do the strategic stuff first and then the operational presentations and whatnot that happen. Um, so then you have that, you walk out of the room with decisions having been made and not just a question mark in the air and to be continued kind of, you know, silence afterwards. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Um, you talked about also, so I'm just looking back at my notes, about being in touch with, you know, the real client base. So how can board members stay in touch with our company's client base and reputation? So what strategies or practices can help them stay in the customer shoes effectively and the people shoes you know the employee shoes also karen yeah queen good great 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 question uh, to take the kind of um customer piece first so yeah. i think one is when the um company is having customer get togethers maybe they're having seminars maybe they're having workshops one it's an opportunity to go along and informally chat to the customers and i i do this a lot so just to go out it's not about monitoring performance it's not it's just about genuinely having a conversation hearing what they think about the business so i think and, and, and understanding their business so i think yeah. one is taking those informal opportunities Two, I think it's if the business doesn't already, just making sure they do have a methodology for getting good customer feedback and insight and ensuring that does filter up to the board at certain points so we get a really good view on, on sentiment. I mean, it sounds an obvious one, but I have met board members who don't follow, for example, the company on X or they don't follow it on LinkedIn. They don't generally do a Google search. And so one thing is just keeping up to date with the sentiment around, you know, the socials. What are people saying on Glassdoor? What are employees talking about? It's tapping into those mechanisms. Again, from an employee base, it's about not just looking at the staff attitude survey findings. It's do they have an employee forum? And can you be a bit of a fly on the wall at that? Just sometimes walk in the halls. And I know obviously this is more challenging in, in the hybrid working environment we find ourselves in now. But I think it's just getting a sense, walking around, sniffing the air, 
what are people doing? Are they productive? Are they happy? Having a wander around and a chat. I think you really pick up those cultural symbols and nuances that you cannot just get from a kind of straight survey. So it's really about putting yourself out there. It's being present, it's being visible, both with the customer base and employee base, and just being receptive, asking, you know, good, good open questions. And also making sure one, one thing I'm really passionate about, and I think is a gap, is that the board can sometimes feel completely disconnected from the organization. So how can you build that connectivity? One way is you have different people come and present at the the board you invite members in or maybe you have a board apprentice or you know there's ways to make that connectivity between the board and the organization feel more joined up than perhaps it, it can sometimes can sometimes be that's a, you know your last point is a really important point because from an organizational perspective you know you send your best only to the board and you hide everyone else away um not saying that everyone else is not the best but if we gave more people an opportunity to actually go up and present to the board, because often is the case, let's say that the paper is sent to the board and you know, to the executive first and then to the board um, to talk to. And it's the people on the ground who've been doing a lot of the work in relation to writing the paper and writing the information for the board. So why not bring those people from the ground to that conversation and just build those relationships and I imagine it would be a richer conversation as well because the board could deep dive further into the details that they need to and get the answers immediately that they need back also Karen. Yeah and also it gives people a development opportunity I mean what greater way is there to learn your presentation and hone speaking to a board than going and presenting your work I think yeah. that's a fantastic opportunity for people's development as well. The best. Now, you also talked about boards being stuck in the past, yeah, you know, <laughs> overdrive into the past. So why is it crucial for boards to focus on the future rather than dwelling? Look at the past, but don't dwell on the past. Um, can you share examples of how this forward-looking approach can benefit companies and what this forward-looking approach could look like? Yeah, definitely, Preen. I mean, to bring it to life with an, an example of a professional service board that I sit on. I think, you know, in the beginning, there was this tendency. And we'd had a tough time. So in tough times, the tendency to look backwards and look at the performance can get even stronger. Like, why haven't we delivered this? What about this? And so tough periods do bring that out. One yeah. of the things we deliberately started to do, though, was to say, look, we are going to come out of this difficult period. How do we want to show up to the market, to our customers, to our employees after that? The main frustration every board member will tell you worldwide is they don't get to spend enough time shaping the strategy. And so that is a critical role. The board's role is to shape that strategy. Yes, the exec may be producing it, but the board's role is to question, challenge, shape, and ultimately hold the executive to account for it. So it's having that strategic conversation that makes sure the board and the organization stay relevant. It would be very easy if you had a backward view to become irrelevant because you're not focused on what is changing. I mean, how often are boards thinking about the macro environment? What's really going on? Do we have all the insight we need? Is our customer base changing? What's our competitor set doing? All of that is really important debate around shaping what does that kind of future look like? And the board should have that future lens. The board should be looking two, three years out and saying, ultimately, what do we want to become? In, in private equity, we, we talk about, you know, our exit, what's, what's our exit strategy? What does the next three to four years look like? How do we ready ourselves? There's an element of making sure that's a critical part of the, the board agenda. Yeah, and you know, so linking back to the work that I do with executives, there's a huge missing piece here as well from an executive perspective in that they don't have that aspirational look two or three years ahead, generally speaking, generally speaking, not everyone's like this, but you know, the organizations that are having more trouble, let's say that I support, have the focus on now or the past on stuff that went wrong. And my question is, all right, well, where are you going? Have you defined where you're going? from an executive perspective. And if they haven't, then obviously they're not gonna be feeding that kind of information to the board. So, okay, I, I see the missing links here now, Karen, so much so, <laughs> definitely. Now, 
with boards, you also talked about those sidebar conversations because, Karen, let's say you and I might get on far more just from a personality perspective or we might have similar uh, thinking patterns or whatever. So you and I, let's say we're on a board and we've got sidebar conversations happening. They do create divisions, though, and it is very palpable. So how can these divisions be addressed? And what are the consequences of these sidebar conversations behavior as well, Karen? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. I mean, it, it's inevitable as humans, we like some people and get on better yeah. with some people. That is just, you know, a fact of life. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with building a relationship with someone on a board, having a dinner. I think where it tips over into becoming an issue is when those conversations don't make it to the full board table. So if you and I were off having a conversation and that wasn't picked up by the rest of the board, then potentially we are missing something because the chances are that's really important and everyone needs to have a voice on it and everyone needs to be aware it's a risk or it's a, an issue. So I would say, and again, I put a lot of emphasis on the chairs role here is making sure that all the debates that are happening are brought to that main table or you delegate it to a committee you know if you've got a, a bigger board or a bigger organization you might have an audit committee remuneration nomination committee yeah. so you can absolutely delegate it to those committees but even the committee work needs to flow back to the main board so I think it's about being sensible i think it's about again as you say recognizing this is a cohesive team and recognizing that everyone's got a different like opinion here it's back to that you know we, we talk don't we about diversity of thought we want all thoughts ideas and suggestions in the mix on all of the the topics but it's not to say you know you can't go and have a relationship on a one-on-one -on -one basis of course that's natural that's yeah. human behavior that that's as, as long as the meaty topics and the risks are being issued uh, you know aired and talked about in in the main board beautiful beautiful um you also talked about um frequent conflicts and you know conflict is normal but when it's unhealthy conflict that's a real red flag so frequent conflicts can be a red flag in that uh, sense what proactive steps can boards take to address underlying issues and foster a culture of that productive debate productive healthy disagreements yeah it's a really good one Prina. I, th I think if you've got a board that's in constant conflict yeah what it probably means is there's, there's some unresolved issues so probably at some point someone felt disenfranchised didn't get feel their voice was in the debate and therefore the issue simmers along and the yeah. board remains at conflict. When I see high conflict board situations, probably one of the best steps you can take is bring someone independent in to perhaps facilitate a session. It might be a board effectiveness review. It might be, you know, bring in an experienced person in to come and facilitate a session and get underneath the issues because it can be quite hard to fix those if, if everyone's part of the the problem right uh, but it's important to to do that because otherwise you're probably running with a very ineffective board of people who feel an underlying sense of dissatisfaction but they're not feeling able to talk about it, it comes back to our psychological safety point and you want to address that you want to nip that in the bud and you want to make sure that that doesn't continue to to fester so I would say get right on top of it bring in independence where you can and be open and honest that there's an issue here you know and I think it's important to to kind of air that in the meeting and say look we don't need to resolve it now but no. we know we've an issue Let, let's think about how do we resolve this because it's not going to be effective for any of us if, if we were to continue it's, it's really been open about it we have to address it because on the flip side if we don't address it resentment will fester and resentment is one of the worst things ever in a team whether it be at the board level or any level yeah that is the worst thing so linking to <laughs> resentment potentially you also talked about the concept of that veneer of collegiality I love the way you said that on boards how can boards strike a balance between a healthy agreement and an honest uh, debate now talk to me first about what that veneer of collegiality means for people who might not comprehend what that is Karen 
Yeah, I mean, Rita, in, in simple terms, it means we're just getting along on the surface. You know, we're all pretending everything's fine. It's back to the yeah. point, you know, I made about we feel like we've got this coveted board position. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to remain positive and smiling and that everything is fine. Yeah. But underneath, there are probably unresolved issues. It's back to the same point. You know, it, it's getting beyond that veneer so that you, you should come out of a board meeting feeling like there was a punchy conversation. It was good debate. There was lots of different points brought to the table. You've got a way forward. But it shouldn't feel so nice and smooth that we're always agreeing and smiling at each other and saying this is fantastic. You've probably then running into a problem and probably about it at a risk. The other thing I'd say related to both our points is the board almost for me is like a microcosm of the rest of the organisation, but the board does set the tone at the top. Yeah. When you've got a conflicting or we're all being nice to each other mentality at the top, that infiltrates down. The CEO, the CFO take that culture down into the organisation and, and it just breeds that kind of behaviour again. So we, I also think the board is a is setting the tone, setting the culture. And if they're not doing that in, in the right way, the consequences for the rest of the organization. But it, again, this, this veneer of collegiality, it's, it's, it's about bringing your honest, open self. It's, it's not, you're not here just to agree and get along and smile and, you know, keep the CEO happy. You're here to bring, you know, that bit of tension to the, to the conversation and ask the difficult questions. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and, you know, so we've talked a lot about the chairperson and their responsibility, but then every single other person on the board has quite the responsibility as well. And especially when we're talking about this veneer of collegiality, we need to have that self-focus. We need to have the honesty and self-awareness as well as to how we're coming across and how we are impacting the wider team, the board team, that is. And our impact, as you said, beautifully said, on the rest of the organization, because this completely is that trickle down effect. And it is very insidious. It gets through, it leaches through the organization, doesn't it? It does. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. It's one to be it's one to be addressed. And I think it's about asking yourself. You're completely right, Prina. It's not just the chair's responsibility. Everyone has a responsibility. It's really about reflecting self and saying, what is the role I'm playing on this board? What am I here? Who do I owe a duty to? You're there to represent the shareholder base, the employee base. You're standing up and asking the questions for, on, on behalf of them. So it's not it's not just about smiling. Equally, you know, if you are wanting to raise a difficult point, you can say that absolutely nicely. And, you know, you want to maintain a good relationship. It's certainly not about being aggressive or putting people's backs up, but it is about being honest and open. And, you know, we, if we think about the boards that have been in crisis or indeed, you know, have collapsed the organisation, it's often when group think happened, no yep. one dared raise and ask the obvious question. And I would always say to anyone, ask the dumb question. It's really? fine. There is no consequence really in the oh, grand yeah. scheme of life. Ask it, you know, ask the daft question that no one wants to, because okay. at the end of the day, it, you're, you're there to do a job and that part of your job is protecting the organisation. Totally. So when we're talking about asking questions, sometimes questions are asked because let's say I have an agenda. I've got, you know, I've got something on my mind uh, and I'm asking this question for my own I guess, agenda needs. So asking questions out of curiosity clearly seems essential. So how can boards shift from asking questions to make a point to genuinely exploring new perspectives and challenging that status quo, as you said? Yeah, I think, again, Prina, the, the board evaluation can help here, because if you do have people who are let's say, always asking the same question, making the same point and just, you know, perhaps just wanting their voice to be heard. I think yeah. that's important feedback to reflect back. We, we we sometimes think feedback is for not the board, it's for all the people in the organisation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Having a good 360 degree feedback on a board is, is so important where you can say, look, you know, sometimes I don't think the questions are quite forward in the debate. I think we re revisited a lot of the same questions. How do we address that? You can bring, you don't need to single anyone out, you can bring it to the table. So I think one is just surfacing that this is about being curious. It's about furthering the debate. Again, come back to the chair. The chair's role is to move things along that are 
feeling the same. You don't want to be having the same conversation. So if the same questions from the same individuals are cropping up, how can you kind of move that along and, and open up perhaps a different debate? The other thing you can do is ask um, specific questions of people. Yes, we rely on a lot of people to contribute, but certainly for quieter perhaps members of the board, how do I draw them in? Well, let me ask them a question. What would you think? What happened when you worked at X? How did it work there? There are ways to start to generate that little bit more um, in, you know, interesting kind of conversation. Uh, so I think that's the way the way to manage it. And, and you know, there, there can be times where as a chair, you might take one of the board members on the side and say, gosh, I've heard, you know, your point about X. And, you know, I think we've, we've we have debated that. Is there anything else I can do to make you feel that and you know perhaps address it more on a one-on-one -on -one basis but board shouldn't be afraid of feedback and if, if we feel like we're revisiting past topics again let's table that and say I think there are more um, demanding challenging questions we need to be asking of ourselves and there's also a bit of reflection again you know you've got a wide span now of board members it used to be a sort of retirement career and now yeah. thankfully we're getting more and more people across the spectrum. So it, it is about bringing all of those um, voices in and asking the different and difficult questions. Absolutely. So when you were talking, I was really thinking about the importance of that chair role and the kind of skills that they need to have. Uh, obviously, all of the skills, which, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one for a board, but then the facilitation skills. And, you know, bringing the best out of people and knowing when to end that conversation and move on and knowing when to pull out, you know, the best from the quieter board members as well. And from a board member perspective as well, um, all of them have to have the best kind of questioning skills and listening skills to truly poke and prod effectively and respectfully. Yeah. It's yeah. so true. And the listening comment you made there, Prina, I don't think can be emphasised enough because, again, we're, we're, particularly when you're new to a board, you want to make a contribution. You want to get your voice yeah. heard in a meeting. And all of that is normal. And getting your voice out in a meeting early is, is a very good um, tip. But listening is so important. And listen to what's not said. You listen to what's said, but what, what are the things that aren't being talked about? And when things are being talked about, what's the body language? What's the feeling? What's the sense that you're getting? That listening and being able to absorb that, I think, cannot be underestimated. And I do see that people sometimes come out of a gate into a board and they're like, right, I need to contribute. I need to ask questions. I need to get my points of view across. But the listening perhaps doesn't uh, come as forthcoming at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, their skills are so huge. They're essential. Soft skills are hard skills, as I keep on saying. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> so true, so true. Well, Karen, you've already given some ideas about board members' involvement outside of board meetings, and that is a totally critical factor to build bonds and to really get to understand, you know, the way of the workplace, the client base and the brand of the organization. So how can boards, especially in private companies, let's go there, ensure ongoing engagement and support? Yeah, so it's a great one, Prina. I think one is you've got a formal role going to the board meetings and accept sort of that, you know, below the line. So then yeah. you go, how else do I contribute? So I think one thing as a board member you should always be thinking about is maybe what's the two or three areas that I can really add value on and agree those, you know, with the chief exec and with the executive team. It may be that they're going through a succession planning. It may be they're expanding to a new geography. Find those areas where you've got expertise that you can dip mm -hmm. in and they facilitate you having other conversations outside of the, the board. The other one I would say is committees are a good way to do that. So, you know, get on a nomination or remuneration or if you've got a financial background, an audit committee. So put your hand up for those kind of committee roles the other is be be out and visible be out in the client offices be out in customer sites customer um you know workshops and um kind of sessions where customers come together maybe around a new product launch so just be out and visible because you're tuning in to the organization the culture and what's kind of really going on so I would say as much as you can now of course this is not a full-time executive role and I'm very conscious that this is yeah. not going every day into the organization but it's finding those moments where dipping in can be really 
um, you know, can be really valuable. And, and you know, actively, you know, board members should want to do that because um, particularly in the beginning, you want to get to know and under the skin of the organisation yes. because your performance then on the board is so much stronger. If yeah. you're trying to advise without really understanding the organisation, often it will miss the mark and the CEO will say, well, the board's not strong enough because they're not, they don't really know us. And so you've, you've got to get under the skin and you've got to stay close enough, um, but not so much that you're in executive territory and exactly. you lose your fine line. And in, it's back to that tenuous, you know, sort of fine line. You're independent, you're impartial. So you've got to maintain that as a core, but get to know the business, ask those questions, be out and, and visible. Um, and, and I think you then find the role more rewarding. I mean, there's nothing yeah. less rewarding than turning up on a monthly or quarterly basis just to look at the data and have that conversation. It will be so much richer with more data points. Definitely. You talk about getting under the skin, you know, so to speak. And I've got a friend, Leanne, who talks about listening to the lyrics of your audience, whatever they are, you know. And once we hear their voice, hello, how much richer is my contribution as a result? Because I really understand that other side as well. I might not yeah. agree with it, but I understand it at least, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just so enriching. Um, One final question. Well, two fun two questions but one final one on boards can you share insights on how boards can proactively work on improving their effectiveness before anything hits the fan before a critical situation that demands unity and collaboration please Karen this is a big question here <laughs> yes how do you become more effective it's a great it's a great question you're right to call out because boards really come into their own when you really need them is a crisis so you yeah. don't want to get ineffective in, in a critical moment. So I think one thing is just being very open about the effectiveness conversation and tabling. You don't need to wait for an annual effectiveness review to say, to assign, you know, 15 minutes at the end of the meeting to, guys, just how can we be more effective? What's working for you? What's not working for you? Again, we do that on one of my boards, surface lots of great ideas that we could then sort of take forward. So one is don't don't wait for an annual effectiveness review. Have effectiveness as an, as an ongoing dialogue. Yeah. I think bringing independence in, though, to the effectiveness conversation is a, is a good one. I think having someone independent who maybe comes and observes the board, maybe has a series of questions, one on one interviews. I think having an independent look can often surface things that you don't know. It's like the hidden things that you're just not aware of it's like as as individuals and in our awareness so I think that is also um one I think the other is is all the things that we've talked about in terms of the red flag so it's about the agenda setting having the right material circulating the right minutes having the right conversations guiding around the right questions it's, it's, it's having all of that up front and saying you know we know these are common red flags are we falling into any of those what what are people's thoughts so it is I think it's having that open and honest conversation but calling things out I mean if, if this is a team of people that's not working then fixing it don't don't wait don't don't let things drift get on top of it and f figure out what the right kind of solution is is there and I think the other thing about effectiveness is boards will become more effective the more diversity we bring and yeah. I think the way we've approached this is you know first and this was a global wasn't it you know first it was fix the women and gender issue fix the ethnicity issue fix the diversity of thought we need to be broader now we need to bring all of that into play we need to bring age sexual preference there's all the dimensions of diversity yeah. and you know we we need to think about effectiveness in in terms of who's around that table if you've got a sea of white male 50 something faces the chances are there is not enough variety and diversity in in the room absolutely Karen you shared so many gems and I cannot thank you enough for really deep diving into all of my poking and prodding questions to you uh, I'm going to put your details in the show notes but before I ask you my final final question is there anything that we've missed in this conversation Karen that you feel we need to talk about now 
I mean, I think for anyone listening, I think it's putting your hand up for a board. I mean, I, I joined my first board. I was 32, so I wasn't, you know, anywhere near retirement age. Yeah. I would encourage people not to think of boards as 50-something, 60-something, you know, generally male, although more women have come through. I think we've got to change our visual representation of the word board. And so if you're listening to this, Boards need younger people. They need digital natives. They need people from different backgrounds. They need people who are neurodiverse. We've yeah. got to be make braver choices. And so my my ask always to people is put your hand up. There are there are many organisations. There are charities. There are private owned companies. There are agencies. There are you know big listed businesses but there's there's a lot of opportunity to start putting your voice onto a board and I think from a career perspective I super valued it so the just having a different like role and perspective was so important in my career I would just encourage people not to feel like boards or something I'll wait until my the end of my exec career and then I will step into it because I'm pre-retirement and I will do this for a time no I think think about it earlier on would be my advice as long as you can manage it with your executive responsibilities, which generally you can and you can make that work if you're, you know, sort of passionate about it. So that would just be my ask to your listeners, you know, th think about it. If it's something that you're interested in, don't don't feel you need to wait. OK, let's ask you another question. So you've talked about put your hand up. What does put your hand up mean? So let's say someone is really interested, someone listening today is really interested and you've given them so much to work off today, Karen, I cannot thank you enough. This person is really interested in joining a board. How do they even begin? Yeah, great, great question, Frida. Well, I have written an article about 10 steps to getting on a board. So I will, I'll link I will to that. that to you so you can link it. So that, that would be one. But generally, find out what sitting on a board really means. Yeah. And think about your why. So why do you want to do it? Mm. Once you've got that, think about the type of organisation you want to join. And once you've got that, then start to have those conversations, typically to help you shape your material. I mean, you do need a board CV. You yep. can't find your executive one. I think, you know, get your, get your marketing materials ready and test them out. I can tell you want it. Whatever you go out to the market with initially is rarely the right thing. So you go out thinking they're really going to buy me because I'm an expert in transformation no no they'll buy you for something else so a friend of mine very experienced businesswoman had run big businesses and they bought her for digital marketing and it's something she did 20 years ago but that was really important so it's really funny but you've got to find the hook yeah. that in your experience that they resonate to and and then once you've done that and you start going out and getting interviews it's about listening to the feedback and, and building but it's it can be tough to secure a first role but it's it really is possible when you've done your homework yeah I know that there's a lot in store so you've got to be serious about it because the expectation on you is huge then and you have to contribute as per everything that Karen has just shared yeah so there's a lot involved it's not just I'll go to a meeting every now and then. <laughs> There's <Yeah>. loads involved. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Um, I have one very important final question for you. So this podcast is called Ways to Change the Workplace. Karen Thomas Bland, if I was to hand you a magic wand, what is one way that you would change the way of the workplace? You could be as creative, as uh, controversial as you want. What is one way you would change the way of the workplace, Karen? make braver hiring decisions i think we still hire in our own likeness we still hire because the person's like me they went to the same school as me we feel similar together i think we've got to be braver and that can be on boards but that can be down at the executive and all the way down an organization i think we've got to be more open to difference more open to new different ideas and we've got to challenge what we think something looks like what does a ceo look like it doesn't have to be white male harvard you know we, we've got to broaden out our what our immediate brain goes to when we hear the title ceo board member chair it's brave braver hiring decisions is is the one for me love it karen so many gems in this one i'm going to put all of your details in the show notes plus 
10 steps to get on the board article that you're going to flick over to me as well. I'll add all of that. Brilliant. Until again, Karen, thank you so, so much. Thank you, Prina. Take care.